I use what we're going to talk about to attempt to make money and pay for my mortgage and all those great things and provide for the family. But um, we're going to talk tonight uh, about trends. And uh, even though, as Professor said, it's out of sequence, uh, it's one of the most basic tenets in technical analysis, in, in my opinion. It's, it's really the underlying uh, fundamental principle by which we can look at a lot of uh, technical analysis. And, and trends are really, in essence, just a, a series of higher highs and higher lows if we're looking for an uptrend and a series of lower highs and lower lows if we're looking for a downtrend. Uh, the interesting thing about trends is they are so simple in their definition, but uh, there's probably one of the most misused uh, types of analysis or misapplied types of analysis um, when you look at it uh, when people try to utilize it. You'll see people put uh, lines all over saying this is a trend and that's a trend. And I think you go back to the basics of you know, look for the series of higher highs and higher lows. That's where the trend is, a series of, of lower highs and lower lows looking for a downtrend. And then there's what I would consider in between uh, that middle trend or no trend, which we call consolidations or lateral consolidations, but there are periods where there are really no discernible trends, where we're not moving up or down. Just as significant from the standpoint of the analysis of knowing that as knowing when there's an uptrend or a downtrend. Um, I think we'll look at the first uh, chart. Uh, what is important to know, too, about the trends is we can look at trends as we do a lot of other technical analysis it, through multiple time frames. So I think the word here that they want you to focus on is the word fractal, meaning that you, know, you look here and there's this major kind of uptrend here drawn through this line where you see this kind of series of higher highs and higher lows. And that's your basic trend. But within that longer term trend, larger trend as it's called here, you see these smaller trends. We have periods of pullbacks along the way. Uh, and what we're looking for when we talk about a larger trend, a longer term trend, a macro trend, is again this ongoing series. So depending on what your time frame is or what your outlook is or whether you're a trader or you're an investor, you know, all of these are opportunities from a trend standpoint to, uh, to make money. Uh, we, can be, we can trade around a core position where we're long, and we can use these accelerated moves up uh, to reduce positions and use the pullbacks back here to be buyers, to build, rebuild a position. If we've missed part of our, our entry point somewhere along this trend, these pullbacks give us an opportunity to, to get into a trade. Um, so really, you can look at it over any time frame. And, and the three major time frames would be you know, short-term, intermediate, and long-term. And everybody has slightly different definitions but, you know, long term is probably looking out over a year. Intermediate term is, is somewhere around four months, five months, six months. And shorter term can be a few days to a few weeks to a month. Um, the other thing I think that's important here, and make it into a different slide, but we'll, we'll stick with this one right here and see if we have to come back to it, uh, is that the, the longer the trend is intact, as you'll see with a lot of your technical analysis, the more significant this is. So, you know, the trend here... We wouldn't expect this little four or five day or four or five week pullback, depending on what this is. This is like a daily chart here, uh, to be all that significant or have that much staying power. We wouldn't put a lot of credence behind this continuing to, to move lower from here. While we have this longer term trend, we would give this a little bit more weight and say that this is much more significant. So if we start to see breaks of this trend line, the longer term one, the larger trend, that's where we start to have more concerns, that we're getting into significant changes in trends. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, too. Uh, one thing I'd like to add, this, the, the line, this is sort of an internal trend line. Right. As you can see, it's not connecting any high or low points. It might be calculated by a, from a least squares of regression, or it might, uh, we don't know, uh, it isn't said. But it's an internal trend line, right? Okay, so what we're seeing here is when the, we, we look to make these trend lines or draw these trend lines. Okay, so we just talked about a series of higher highs and higher lows. Here are the peaks. So what we want to do is connect these peaks. Okay, and this would kind of be the, the upper end of this trend channel. And what we want to do is connect the troughs down here. And that would be the lower end. For something that's trending higher, typically we would just look at this, these troughs down here and connect these low points. So this point here can be connected with this point. We have a higher high here versus here. Then we have this low here going to a higher high and so forth and so on. So all these lows, as long as they make another reactionary high after them, we can consider that part of that ongoing trend. Everybody's good with that? Makes sense? Okay. 
So um, what we're saying here is that the most basic kind of a trend is just looking for peaks and troughs, troughs. by inspection on the chart, right? It's, yeah, it's that simple. It really is. I mean, it's, you know, this is the price action. Remember what's happening underneath here is that we're evaluating supply and demand, and for this to occur, you're having greater demand than supply to push this out to new highs. So you're, you're having buying overcome selling. Uh, in general, or over a period of time, on average, you're having more buying than selling to create an uptrend. You're having more selling than, than buying to create a downtrend. So just remember what we're looking at within here. It's just not lines, but it represents supply and demand on any given day, and then a pattern of supply and demand over this period of time. So what we did here is we just connected those lines. Now, the thing that's tricky about the trend lines, and everybody asked the question, you know, how specific, how exact do you have to get? You're trying to capture as many points as you can. Okay? Sometimes it, it works great, and you'll match up point after point after point. It'll hit that trend line, and it's like magic. It bounces off of it. It goes up. Sometimes you get moves like this where you kind of chop around, and you get a little bit of a push to the downside. But as long as you can capture the majority of these points, this is what we're looking to do. Okay, so you try and fit it the best way you can. Let me, let me say one other thing about sure. this chart. It looks, it looks, uh, it might look kind of weird where it's uh, at the beginning of the trend. There's lots of conventions. You can pick your own. The first point of this trend is drawn from the lowest, is drawn from the closing price the day of the low. That's where that line was drawn. That's why it is a, you see a couple of bars poking underneath it. Because some the person who made this chart, in this case Charlie Kirkpatrick, decided that that's how I'm going to identify a bottom. The closing price, the day of the low. And then, and then he connects from there. So. Okay, so that's a great point. And then you know, somebody else may pick the absolute low saying, you know, that's really where the buyer stepped in, and that's the significant level. You know, and, and for this point, it's not going to make that much of a difference, obviously. Sometimes, you know, when you get into a volatile market like we're currently in, you're getting multiple point swings and multiple percentage swings over a period of time, you'll have big spikes in both directions. And it makes it a little bit more challenging to pick what you're going to consider to be the right trend line or, or how you want to do it. And uh, like the professor said, he's just kind of interpreting it the best way you see fit, what, what you're comfortable with. I'm kind of a purist. I like to use the lows. Um, but, you know, we also like to gather as many points to make sure that we don't get too focused on any one point. It's, again, you know, here's an uptrend, right? It's pretty simple to see. We don't need to get more in, in more detail than that right now. As far as this is concerned, it's just trending higher. You get a period of consolidation. Even within this consolidation, you can kind of see that there's a little uptrend going on here where, you know, we're trying to poke out above these highs, or at least we attain the same highs, and you're getting buyers coming in at subsequently higher levels each time. Buyers are getting more anxious. They're not waiting for the pullback. Maybe there's not as much selling going on there, so the buying that is coming in is influencing the stock more and more, creates the next leg up, and so forth and so on. Good? Okay. Oh, well, yeah, you missed a candle. I missed a couple there. Let me just uh, yeah. say one other thing about this, because uh, this is something we learned, or should have learned already in this course. The stock has a breakout here at 28. So 28 was a resistance level, right? So what happens after the breakout? What do we know about 28? Come on. Right, it's, a, it's an area where we're going to look for support. Right? In fact, it has held a couple of times already. Yeah, that's a great tenant, and that works. Old resistance becomes new support, and old support becomes new resistance. This is where you're, you know, you had a lot of buyers in here, and you start to take out this price. All these guys that were up here with a profit, as that thing gets under 28, it's now a loss. It starts to influence the way you think about the trade. Okay, so now this is just um, the same chart done with candlesticks. Have we learned candlesticks? Mm -hmm. Okay. So candlesticks, right, we're looking at, at a little bit more information each one of those bars. where We have uh, the, um, the low, the high, we have the open, the close, and then where you close the relationship to where you opened on the day, right? So those white real bodies mean that we had up days and the dark real bodies mean we had down days. So really nothing changes here as far as drawing the trend line. It applies the same way as it would to any chart, uh, you know, any regular bar chart. Same, same lows down here. This time we used the actual lows. We didn't use the closing prices. And then we drew this up this way. Yeah, I think I, think I actually might have drawn the tre uh, trend line from the lowest Real body. Real body, Might correct, have, right. Uh, so if, that's, yeah, if you're making that distinction, right, between how we drew the last one from 
the closing basis. Now it's the lowest real body. So again, it's just lots of ways to do it. Pick your spot. You know, this is also, if you, if you look at it here, uh, kind of like what we call, I'll use the term ring low. We'll look at a couple of the charts later that'll have that. But it's where you had your lowest point and you have two bars around it uh, that kind of close above where this one was. So it kind of creates that little pivot point, right? So and those are good, those good points. Sometimes you'll see them where um, the entire day's action is both higher and lower than this. This one isn't quite there because we, we did trade down below this point. And we'll call that a three bar reversal. Again, it's significant. It kind of is a little pivot point where you had some downside pressure. You had a little bit more. You didn't close there. You moved up. And then the next day it starts to move up. Suggests a little bit of a short term momentum switch back to the upside. So it's like another little tidbit. Some guys will trade off of that. You know, it's very, very short term, but it's another hint at what might be going on when you're looking for that trend to emerge or start. Uh, you know, that's significant from the standpoint of, you know, big down day, another down day, you know, an attempt to rally that fails, another down day, and we kind of get this little pivot point followed by this one, then we get the big up bar. You can see the switch going on right there. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, support and resistance zones. Um, you know, here is kind of the inverse, first of all, of what we were looking at with the other chart. So here's a, an indication of, of a situation where the Walt Disney is now beginning to move lower in this particular example. So all we did is flip it over, right? Uh, there's not much there to, other than that where you can see that. But what you have is a period here where we just talked about um, old resistance becoming new support. Well, here you are trading lower. Okay, and first we have a, a little downtrend working here, right? We connect this point and this point. Everybody sees that? Okay, so we know that we're moving lower. Here's your lower low off of this, this reactionary high. Here was a low, went to a new low. So we can kind of say that the major trend would be here to the downside. So what you had here is you had good support coming in just above $28. So remember, we saw that breakout in the previous chart above $28. So it tested it once, bounced up, didn't quite get back to these old highs. So you say, oh, you know, losing a little bit of momentum here. Not at this point, but down here we start to turn back down. And now you've come down to 28 again before we were able to make a higher high. And you start to break this level. So again, everybody that bought 28 looking for 30, 35, 40, stock only gets up towards 29.75 here, or 28.75 into the 29 range, doesn't get that price. They're all sitting there with a loss right now to get this big bar down. Okay? Now we're starting to trend lower from here, 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 here. So this is our first break. Find support down here at 25, you know, we'll call it 25.50 in that range right there. So that's our first point here. Another reaction up. Okay, so here we are again. Perfect example. Now this was our old support. Now it's new resistance. Can't get through this. So all those buyers that had bought 28 on the breakout decided, well, I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt. Moves down here, now they're not real happy, sitting there with a loss, now they're back to 28. I'm even, I'm out. So you get some selling here at 28. No buyers coming in, nobody to take, absorb that selling, so what does it do? Stock starts to drift back down. 28.50 comes down to this level again. This is where we saw buying the first time. We see some buying here again, because the guys that had bought this decline, geez, that was a pretty nice bounce. I'm going to try it again, or I missed that one, I'm going to buy this one. Gets up to 28, fails again. Same point. Great resistance point up here. Can't get through there. Pulls back. Now, at this point, I'll make the point here, and you have this kind of series of the same high. You have the same low. Then we have this kind of lower, uh, or I should say higher low, okay, where it didn't pull back all the way across the range. So this might be initially an interpretation where you say, oh, you know, well, maybe this consolidation is actually going to break out to the upside, okay? Because this point F here, we didn't pull back all the way. And we turn back up. We get here to 28. Didn't get through 28 again. We go sideways. Then we have this other shot up here at 28. So if you look at this, you know, you might want to say, well, here's a trend line, you know, from here to here to here. Okay? So I could draw this point against this point because this reactionary high. So would you, if you were trading this, you might actually look at this as kind of being bullish. Okay? But if you're looking at this, you're still not quite certain. And the fact that you've already broken this support area gives you more concern. So you can see where somebody is buying here and selling here and making money, here and here making money, even here to here making money, while everybody else who's looking at it a little longer term really has done nothing. It's just chopping around, right? 
So then we had this kind of big reversal bar here where you got up as high as 28 and you finished down here at the low of the day. Those are nasty. You know, that traps a lot of people, bull traps. Uh, could have been a good piece of news. Everybody thought the earnings were great and the stock was on its way back up. Doesn't happen, breaks to the downside. When you get those big reversal bars and you get a follow through, that's very dangerous. Uh, you, you've got a big, big, big momentum switch here. And these things typically will kind of crater like you saw it here. Well, all of a sudden now you get three, four, five, six days in a row to the downside. We break through the support at 2850. You know, final little support 2575. You know, big bar up here, back to that resistance. And now we got the new resistance area, 25, excuse me, 2675. Uh, Couldn't see it from over here, sorry. Okay, so just that kind of sequence. Good? All right. Okay, so here are these reversal points that we were talking about earlier. So we have a situation where move down, reaction back up, get about this high, can't move any further, move down. Buyers are coming in here, sellers here, so forth and so on. So we kind of talked a little bit about this in the other chart. I jumped ahead, I apologize. Um, but this is kind of just pointing out all of those pivot points. And again, what's nice about these pivot points is, you know, they have these little highs in place where they've taken out the previous day's high, and then they kind of have the next day where they were never able to get above that high. So you can see where, you know, the buying kind of dried up, ran out. The momentum to the upside is running out. Same on the downside, where you get these, these reversals to the upside. Not every one of these, just so you know, it's not that clear cut that every one of these is always going to work. But typically it's a good signal to give you an indication of what's happening from the standpoint of that momentum switching. Okay. Okay, so here's big one-day reversal. So we talked about, again, what happens when you have those one-day reversals. Here's the big move up from September. You know, you got a very nice uptrend that's working here, right? This is all in place. And then you have this, so I'll call it a return line. And uh, it's a situation where this is the upper end of the trend channel. And you can see here that you have this acceleration. And we'll talk a little bit about that more later, too. But you have a situation where the momentum, where the trend is now accelerating to the upside. The problem with these, it's great to be in here when this is happening. And you saw a lot of this in the end of like 99 into early 2000 with the tech bubble. So I don't know if anybody you know, was messing around stocks back in the tech bubble. But you had lots of stocks in the last few months of the rally. You know, nice orderly uptrends and all of a sudden they blow out to the upside like this. And what happens here is it kind of creates a situation where you can get exhausted very quickly. You run all the buyers in. And really, the reason a stock tops at any particular point in time, whether it's just an intermediate term uh, top here or it's a bigger, longer term top like up here possibly, uh, is you run out of buyers. There's just nobody left to be a buyer. So sometimes the pullbacks occur not so much because they're selling, there's just a lack of buyers. And you get that kind of vacuum drop. The same to the upside here. Um, you know, when you get rallies, sometimes there's not a lot of buyers, it's just a lack of sellers. But these drops are, are not uncommon, and it's just typically because you ran all the buyers in, it gets exhausted, and you have a shot to the downside. So now this pullback, interestingly enough, while it accelerated, and it did correct, and this was a pretty nasty correction. So if you're a buyer up here, you know, just remember, somebody did pay that price of 2075 or what that was, some poor person, you know, who had the unfortunate experience. Uh, is, is owns the stock here, and we had this kind of volatile sharp breakdown back under 1950. So, you know, it's, it's a one-point move. It's Disney, but on a percentage basis, that's a pretty big drop. It's a pretty volatile drop. But interestingly enough, all of this chopping around after that reversal bar still maintain this longer-term trend line. So as you pull back here again to this point, you get another pivot point back to the upside. Still haven't taken out these highs. Okay, and for this to really be considered the next point in the trend, we need this move to occur. Okay, so we still have this kind of uptrend. It holds here. Now we know that this point is valid because we break out to this high. We continue to stretch it out. And it's going to come in just about here. Another accelerated move. And then what they want us to point out here is this two-day reversal. You see the big bar up, another attempt to go, and then the move down. And then the big move, so forth and so on. And this is where the trend line gets broken here at 2050 over here. Okay. So the other thing you can look at, and it's a good indication, is when you start getting this volatility, we are, I like the expression because I was taught it by somebody else that's going to actually do one of your classes. You know, you always get volatility at tops and bottoms. The key is knowing which one it is. So sometimes, you know, you look at this and you're going to use your other technical measures and your other technical concepts to say, you know, we're getting an awful lot of volatility after this move up 
you can just look at that and see that looks a little bit different. It's extended. You're starting again to blow through the upper end of the return line or move through that. It's a situation where, again, you're starting to grab a lot of buying very, very quickly. There's a lot of uh, energy around that trade. And once it, it stops and it doesn't continue, there's, there's typically not much under there. And you'll get these very, very sharp moves back to the downside. And, you know, we've seen a lot of this in the last few months just because of the way the market's been trading and all of the headline risk and all the news and all of the government intervention. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, too, just in a real-world example of what's going on now. But I think that's, that's what we're trying to point out here is these reversals you have to be very careful of because this will have a tendency to change the trend. And here you can see that the trend that was in place from September to April, so we're talking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, an eight-month move is now suddenly kind of disappearing. If you're not paying attention, it didn't take much. If you were a buyer here, even at 18 at these lows, you know, to give back all of your money if you weren't paying attention to that trend. Okay? Also note that there was huge volume on the downside. Uh, I, yeah, I didn't even see that. Good on, point. On this move down as mm -hmm. well. So often, big changes in volatility, big changes in volume, around trend changes. <clears throat> That's a great point. And I'll, I'll make one comment on the volume, too. I, I didn't see it down there at the bottom of the chart I was looking up here. Is if I could have, somebody asked the question, if you could have, you're on a deserted island, and you could have one indicator, what would that indicator be? And it would be volume. Okay, volume is a proxy for buying and selling. So when you see those big volume days coming in to the upside, that's great. There's a lot of accumulation. When you see that big volume day to the downside, that's not so good. There's a lot of people running for the exit at that point. You know, and it doesn't take much. And, you know, these highs, reversals on that kind of volume, those typically turn out to be the high for a long time uh, in, in stocks like this, in moves like this, I should say. So when you see that kind of reversal on the biggest volume this has traded in the last seven months, it is what it is. It's a signal. It's a sign. Don't ignore it. Don't think it doesn't matter. Don't say, well, yeah, it's a lot of volume. It's not a big deal. Because everybody will point out the volume, but nobody will sell. They'll say, geez, that was a lot of volume in that reversal. But, you know, that's a significant change. There's a lot of people running to the exits at this point. And it takes a lot to get that going up. And then you get the next break, and you still have increased volume over what was going on in the consolidation. So volume is also relative uh, in what's going on. So you're looking for increases or decreases over the previous day. So what you typically like to see in these uptrends are where you see the volume coming in, you want to see the volume coming in on the up days. You want to see during the pullback in here, you want to see progressively lighter volume on average. You know, one day here, one day there is not going to matter. This one day does matter. This one day could matter. And, and these like this. Well, I had another thing. More than likely, <clears throat> in here, when, that, when the stock got whacked on big volume, there was some unfavorable news. More than likely. And you don't want to fall into the trap of saying, well, there was bad news, but the stock has come down, so it's discounted. Now I can go ahead and uh, and, and resume the uptrend. There's always a reason for the stock's movement. Sometimes we know it, some, sometimes we know it, sometimes we don't. The point is, the market speaks. You know, we're interpreting the chart, not the news. The, the stock's reaction to the news tells us that it was important in this case. So. <clears throat> okay, so now, <clears throat> high volume reversal. So again, I keep jumping ahead on these slides. I'm always one step ahead. It's terrible, right? So here's a situation where you know, here's the big reversal. So we're isolating, um, I guess, this point here. And you're looking at here now, just to give you an idea of the time frame, we're looking at a few weeks here. The other time, we were looking at eight months of action. So we're isolating this one-day reversal here. $23 is the resistance area. It's the resistance area because that's where the upside stopped. Do we know that going into the day? There may have been some other price action over here that said this was a resistance area. But looking at the chart here, this is now resistance because of that reversal. We got this high. The sellers came in, you have this big reversal bar. Okay, again, significant. You don't, you don't see these all that often, but you see enough of them depending on the market environment. And they are significant, and they are frustrating, especially if you're a buyer prior to this and you just got paid all that money and suddenly it's gone. And, you know, the reaction that you can have to this is to hope it's going to come back, or the reaction you can have to this is that's a significant negative and step out of the way and, and move on to something better. Uh, you know, that's a little bit more about the psychology of trading, but... You know, that's what's happening here is that these reversals occur for a reason. Could have been a news event. Uh, it, could have been a, it could have been a positive news event that everybody ran in on a great earnings announcement or on a takeover speculation or on a new you know, theme park opening up for Walt Disney or a new management uh, change or something like that. Everybody gets in, and that's it. You know, it's the last piece of uh, good news. Everybody's figured it out. We all own the stock, and then you get these reversal bars. 
and you can see that it follows through. You get a throwback. This isn't uh, uncommon either that after this original pullback, you're going to have an attempt to move back to those highs or get up to those levels. And when that fails, then you have the move down. So this actually is, is the signal. This recovery rally, this little minor uptrend here that gets you back into this zone, didn't even get you back here, that rolls over this quickly. This is really a great spot to be, we'll say in this particular case, a seller if we're long or trying to short the stock if we're going to play the downside of it. Because we know for a fact that that is definitely resistant. It's failing. It's starting to roll over. So you're adding more credence, more reason to get short. You know, I like to think of it as a weight of the evidence, right? You line up all of the things that are for and all of the things that are against. So you're getting more and more things against this, being in this position. And now you can look to go to the downside. The volume is here again. Big reversal bar on this recovery. You now the volume is much lighter than what it was coming down on. And then you can see the volume beginning to pick up again during the decline. So it's anxious sellers, very few buyers, very few buyers left, not so anxious buyers. You know, and what, what causes this is everybody that missed this rally sees this pullback, you know, a little minor support area here again coming into 2050, 2075. You know, I'm going to be a buyer here because I think it's got a shot to go back to 23. Moves back up here. You know, do I take the profit? Do I not? Boom, right back down. So that's what, that's what happens. But everybody that's a buyer here, the guys who didn't sell it here, have another opportunity. And that's, you know, what is it, what's the expression, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. So you don't want to get caught twice in that position. Note, the one-day reversal is a day with a big range, a big move up and a big move down. You can see that it closed just about where it opened. So what the, the, that big tail on the upside would appear as a, as a big sh uh, shadow on a, on a, on a, uh, on a, a candle chart. So you need volume, you need a big range, poor close. All of that would be a one-day reversal to the downside. And, of course, the opposite were true if it was in a downtrend. Everything would be the same um, uh, ups upside down. Okay, so this is what we talked about in the beginning where there's a third option, which is these lateral consolidations uh, that I like to call them. So what you have here is you have just basically a trading range. Um, it's a situation where, you know, we have a series of highs that can't get through a certain level, and then we find support down here, series of lows that aren't violated as well. So the resistance line, you can see, is just drawing a, a lateral line across the top of these highs. Saying, okay, 28, what was this one, $28 is where we keep getting to and we can't get through, can't get through, we get a pullback. Bless you. Uh, and what you have here is you have a low, a low, and you have other lows. So taking some liberty... You can't connect all of the lows at the, with the same straight line, with the same lateral line. So we'll create a little bit of a zone and say it's a range. And I always think it's better to think of support and resistance as a range than an absolute number. I think uh, Phil, you would agree I, I, with absolute, that. Absolutely. You know, I people, mean, it's, people it's get very rare that right. it's going to be a point. So right. This, this is very rare. This 28, like, boom, boom, spot on, full figure every time. Very unusual. So I think it's better to think about it as a range. It's a zone. It's an area. Uh, and it just gives you a little flexibility. Because... You know, if you're trying to use this, let's say, as a range to trade, and you're going to be shorting the stock at 28 with a stop at 28.25, you know, how much room do you want to give it? How much room do you want to give it to play out? Because at one point, the specialists and other traders are trapping you. They might be trying to run you into the stock, and it takes you out, and then they reverse them back down. So, you know, that all becomes a little bit about, you know, how you like to trade, how much uh, room you want to give them. It's a kind of, again, a, a personal choice issue. But the zones are always, it's always better to think of these as little resistance areas or zones. I think that's it on this one. <clears throat> Note the very last uh, couple of bars was a bounce back, back to what had been support and another failure. So. Yeah, these are actually great examples of that, that adage of you know, the old support and new resistance. Okay, so this is another technique that, that we use. I like to use it as well, and it's kind of creating a trend channel. So this particular trend channel is created by looking for a one standard deviation move off the center of this trend. So it's a regression analysis, right? So it's pretty simple. You can do two standard deviations. You can do one, whatever fits. This one is talking about one standard deviation. So you can see that the highs kind of fail at a one standard deviation move, and the lows hold at the same one standard deviation move to the downside until they don't. This is where it breaks here. But that's what you're basically looking to do, and it creates this kind of range where you can gauge 
where the buying may end up stopping, where the selling may end up stopping, and help you understand within this trend uh, where you're going to find support and resistance within that trend. Okay, and again, the main point of this is that you have a trend, higher highs, higher lows. We're moving higher over this period of time. It's March to September, so uh, you're talking six months roughly, and that's what you have until you break here. Now, what you had on this point here in the latter part of this is you had this accelerated move up. And just realize, I should have said this earlier, I apologize. This is all the same chart of Walt Disney, right? We it's haven't the same even looked at any different security. We're looking at it from all these different angles, uh, different points in time, and all these things that are happening within, you know, that six, nine months of trading. You know, we've highlighted a couple of more specific points and now just applying a different type of trend analysis to it. So here was that reversal bar that we saw on the previous slide where we broke through the upper end, you get accelerated, and then it comes back down, finishes in here back in the middle of the, of the range, and we roll over, we have a break, snap back to resistance, and, and a break here. So what you're looking for, and a lot of I think technical analysis too, is looking for the change, it's looking for what's different. So everything's moving along kind of in a trend, in a certain pattern, and things change. Uh, volume changes, the price configuration changes, the volatility changes, the bars become more erratic. You know, it's very, very orderly, and then you have this big, big reversal. It's changed. Something's different. You know, it's not what it was. So these things, as they occur, are very, very important pivot points in what's happening. You've broken, you know, the lower end of this regression analysis of this trend channel for the first time since it be the rally began ba back in March. Is that significant? It's significant because it's a change. It's different. You know, you had a big reversal, and now you're breaking down to the lower end. You have this recovery, and you come back down below it. So even if I don't want to short this, or I don't want to sell this, I have another opportunity. Here's my rally. I say, okay, everything's fine. That's a little bit of a shakeout. I don't believe it. You know, the fundamentals are great on the company. The next quarter earnings is going to be super. Uh, theme parks are doing fantastic. Whatever the reason is. All, all those lovely fundamental things that fundamental analysts like that us, we technicians don't care for too much. No, just, we care about them, but... We're more, we're more concerned with the price action. So that's what's happening here. So now we break back below and roll over. Something's going on and something's different. You know, there's somebody, there's selling coming into it for any particular reason. It could be lots of reasons. It could be a single reason, but there's sellers in there. The trend channel that we've drawn about that regression line gives us some idea or some comfort in what the overall trend looks like. But remember... To go from an uptrend to a downtrend, we're going to go from a situation where you have higher highs and higher lows to a situation where you have lower lows and lower highs. As much as it might be looking like an uptrend that's failing, it is still an uptrend until you get the change in the configuration, which is ultimately what happens in this one. Okay. So now we're going to talk here about accelerating trend lines. So again, same chart of Walt Disney, September through April. And here was uh, that big reversal bar, I think, is right here. All right, we're back to that reversal bar. But what you can see here is that you have one trend, which is relatively flat. You know, it's the beginning of this move up. So we had this low, we had this high, we have this pullback here, and then this higher high. So this is all intact. Then what happens is, as this move occurs, you get another trend line that's accelerating to the upside and so forth and so on. This move creates this accelerating trend line. So the slope of these lines, typically 45 degrees, just kind of moving up, nice, steady, orderly move. That's what you like to be in if you're a momentum investor, if you're trading the trend. You're just looking for this to move higher. It's boring. It's easy, making higher highs. When these things start to accelerate, as I mentioned earlier, it's great to be in them when it happens, to be long them, because you're making a lot more money a lot quicker at this point here than you were during this rally versus even this rally. But as this happens and the acceleration occurs, it gets to a point where it can't be sustained. Okay, And the steeper this gets, the more vulnerable it's going to become to reversing. I think that's kind of an important point to realize. You know, we joke sometimes and say you know, it's going to go backwards in time. You know, These things will get so extended to the upside that you're waiting for them to curl back over this way because it just can't sustain it. And what ends up happening is you get these reversals. Now we're talking about Walt Disney, so there's not a huge amount of beta or volatility in this stock on any given day, um, but you get the point that these reversals here after these big, big moves are concerned. So these accelerating trend lines are fine as long as it continues to move higher, 
But then you have to be on the lookout for these reversals, these three bar reversals, these pivot days. You know, even in this case here, this big reversal bar kind of was uh, suggesting that we were in a little bit of difficulty here. This managed to hold it together, and this was the big break. You know, here's your confirmation. You know, big move down. Here's the next piece of, you know, the next confirmation is a break of that trend line. So again, even all through this accelerated move up over the last couple of months, you never really broke that trend line. And here you're doing it for the first time. And just look at, again, how long it took to get from 1950 to 2250, and then how quickly it comes back down. And there's a reason for that, too. I'll just mention it briefly, is fear is a much stronger emotion than greed. So people panic and get out of the way much quicker than they'll be a buyer. Buying is kind of a gradual process. Selling happens in a rush and a flush. So when we talk about peaks and troughs, and you talk about, I'm sure we'll see a couple of charts later on where we see the inverse of this, where we have a downtrend that reverses back to the upside, you'll see that much more, those are usually much more volatile moves and they take off from there. So it's, it's kind of a, uh, a more of a flush out process on the downside. The tops are kind of a process, uh, uh, taking time longer. Uh, but the selling, when it comes in, is usually very, very quick and very, very fierce because people are worried about the money they're losing or the profits that they're giving up. You know, we can be kind of gradual back here as a buyer and be patient and pick it up where we want. Lines are cheap, you know, and we draw them in pencil. You can erase them and plot new ones. Right. All, all, the lo all the trend lines that are on this chart, uh, this one, this one, this one, etc., they can all be extended out across this chart. And what will, we, what will we find? We will find the stock so far above them that the lines are, meaning, are meaningless. That's why we're looking for uh, closer support lines, uh, so we have, so we can try to reduce the risk when the stock is accelerating on the upside. You know, here, here we have a, uh, this is about a point, a couple of point reaction. We break this steep uptrend line. If we're, if we're use, still using this one, you know, we'd have, to, we'd be giving up another, another, another dollar. So it's all about trying to control risk. That's why we're looking to have the best fit. Yeah. And lines are cheap. Remember, pencil is cheap. Yeah, I'll make one point here too. You know, it, it's it, we call it like the trend line game or the moving average game. You can always find a spot of support or resistance if you look hard enough. So this is a great point. You know, we could extend this original trend line out and say, hey, we're still in an uptrend. No reason to be worried about it. And you know, maybe you have a three-year time horizon and you're not looking to move in and out of the stock that quickly. So this is still a valid trend line. It's still above it. You're still trading above it, right? You know, here's a low with a high, and here's a low where you made all these higher highs, or this trend line, or this trend line. So, you know, pick the one you want, but just be careful with that, because you can always find a reason to be in a stock, you know, and you can always find a reason to be out of a stock, at least through technical analysis, or any analysis. There's always a reason to be in or out of it, so. But anyway, go ahead. We're always concerned with profit versus risk. You know, if we're buying this stock at 22, and for some kind of an account, it might be legitimate. Somebody's looking to scalp it. They sure as hell don't want to be using a stop under that lowest trend line, right? Uh, so uh, we're always looking to, to compare the risk to, to the potential. And, uh, you know, if the risk is three points and the potential is one, that ain't a good trade, right? Well, we had that conversation earlier, too. We were talking, and, you know, a client calls you up, and he says, you know, what do you think of Walt Disney? <laughs> well, you know, what, 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 what do you mean? What do I think of Walt Disney? I think, you know, short term, you got a problem. Stock broke down. I think, you know, intermediate term, there's still a chance it's going to hold on. And I think long term, uh, you know, it's still in an uptrend. What's your time horizon? So you, you could give three or four different answers to that question and not knowing what the client is asking or understanding the position he's in. And if he's he goes in, through all of that, he'll say, I'm short. <laughs> and we'll say, good. <laughs> okay, so this is a... a in, I guess a, an extrapolation or an add-on to what we're talking about with those multiple trend lines, okay? So if we go back to the original pivot point, we draw the steepest trend line, we can see that that's broken, and then we have another one here and another one here. So these things are fanning out, and it, it creates a situation where you have decreasing slope of those trend lines or decelerating trend lines. And the reason for it, as you can see, is you, know, you have lateral price action here. This really isn't making much more progress anymore on the upside. Right? This was the last real peak. Then we had a recovery attempt that doesn't go anywhere, a lower recovery attempt, and a subsequent lower recovery attempt. So you know, this goes from kind of being in a trend to something that's starting to flatten out or decelerate. Um, there's no 
you know, we'll call it huge uh, pivots. You know, there's a couple in here. These are the ones we've looked at here before. But this is just a lot of noise, a lot of choppiness. But the trends are eroding. They're decelerating. You're losing, uh, you know, all this upside momentum. And in a sense, you know, you want to see this reset. You want to see this break out to the upside for these trends to continue. But they're not. It breaks to the downside. Is there anything else, Phil, that's missing on this one that I didn't mention? Is well, uh, yes, getting across? Some, some traders uh, uh, will um, make a rule that says, I ain't staying with this stock after it breaks the third trend line. Right? So uh, a convention is the third one is, uh, is, a, is, a, is going to be a problem. I mean, it could be two, it could be four, but that's a convention that a lot of people use. And, of course, this chart is, shows that perfectly. That's the reason it was chosen. <clears throat> that's the other thing. You always find a chart to prove your point. <laughs> the trick is getting them before that happens, or finding them as that's happening. <laughs> uh, okay, trend line with a channel line. So, you know, here's a situation where, you know, you have this upward sloping trend line yet again, you know, series of higher highs, higher lows, can't emphasize it enough. Uh, and then we have our return line. So this is kind of the upper end where we keep running into a little bit of resistance. You can see they're typically always parallel. That's the other thing we should have made is that these are typically parallel lines. And then what you can see here is this kind of, again, deceleration or the slope of the line eroding as we make this high up here and then this high up here. So you can see that you're losing your upside momentum. Uh, and if we kind of connect these lines and this lines, you can just kind of see that between here and here is beginning to narrow. Right, so the spread between these lines, it's no longer parallel. This is beginning to collapse to the downside. You're still seeing the uptrend. You're not getting as much upside momentum or upside price action as you were previously getting off of these lows or these reaction lows back to the trend line. Another indication that something's changing, that it's not what it was. If we were to draw this line in, what, what, pat, what kind of pattern are we tra tracing out? Wedge. It's a wedge, right? It's a, and what kind of wedge is it? Is it good or bad, this pattern? Bad. bad. Yeah, it's a rising wedge and an uptrend, bearish pattern, right? Rising wedge is messy. Just, it's just, if you think about what's going on, you know, you're, you're getting a contraction of volatility. You're getting moves that aren't going anywhere. It gets very, very sloppy. It gets very, very loose. So, again, you know, people will look for these. They may not look for them. The point is, is that this is a pretty clear cut one, but as that thing starts to narrow towards the apex, you know, and you get those, those wedges like that, again, something's changed. It's not the neat orderly pattern it was where we're going back and forth nice and neat, nice 45 degree angle to the upside. This is starting to converge. It's a warning sign. What do you do with that warning sign? Again, it depends on your time frame. It depends on why you're in the trade. It's up to you. Um, what do we do? You know, I don't like to be around for that stuff. It drives me crazy. You know, you don't, you don't want to have to keep making the same money over and over again. So when you make your money, it's always nice to take something out of the trade. So if we're lucky enough to be a buyer here, or even on this breakout where we see the big change, you know, this is going to kind of be my stop point, maybe this gap, by the way. I'm sure you guys talked a little bit about gaps as part of uh, patterns and what happens there. But, you know, fill this gap once. I don't want to be around. I might even be gone here on this, on this move to the upside. Just It's enough for me. You know, I'd rather be out wishing I was in, then in wishing I was out. It's the way I like to think about it, give you a little expression. Because when you're trapped in these things and you're stuck and you could have sold 22 and you're selling 20, you know, you're awful angry, to put it nicely. You know, it doesn't, it's always very hard. Always buy it back. You can always buy you know, it back. The, the, there's this fear of being whipsawed that you have to get out of your head. Small losses are better than big losses, you know. So yeah, and always yeah. You will be whipsawed. There are, I mean, we were just talking about the, the current market environment. It has gotten so tight in, in so short term that everybody says it must be a great trading environment. It's a terrible trading environment. You cannot get the market to move in the same direction for two days, let alone three or four hours in a row. So it, it's just it's a you know, very difficult thing. So again, small losses, risk control. The tougher it gets, the smaller you want your losses to, to be, the tighter you want your stops to be. You can't give it the benefit of the doubt. Again, understanding the environment you're in is also part of this. And I think the thing I would emphasize, and we'll go through some more of these charts, but just at, on a personal level from technical analysis, it's a cumulative 
study that you guys are doing, you're learning all different pieces, and I would encourage you to incorporate a little bit of each of those. It builds. It's, it's nice to get confirmations. You know, it's nice to see the right pattern within the trend. It's right to see the nice volume configuration within the trend. You're going to learn about oscillators and other indicators. It's nice to see those confirming what you're seeing in the trends. And those are other tools that you'll utilize to help you find, is this a significant pivot point or is it just, you know, enough for the pullback and I'm okay in it or do I have a major problem? And you'll look for divergences in terms like this. And I don't know if, we've, if they've used any of those terms yet. We've, no, we've we used we all have. that stuff. So, yep. again, it's a cumulative uh, discipline, and it's all important. And finding what works for you is important. But, you know, always look for confirmations. Always look for all the tools. Sometimes you're not going to agree. Sometimes, you know, you're going to have three that agree, say one thing and three that say another. You know what I do? You go to the next chart. You don't need it. There's too many stocks. There's too many opportunities. And if it's in the indexes and we have no choice, you know, we'll have to make a call. But we'll know that we kind of even up on, on whether or not we have opportunity or we have risk. And then you can, you know, create a situation where you trade accordingly. How big of a bet you're going to make in that environment, how small of a bet you're going to make in that environment. That notion is very important because it's frequently we're not going to have a strong opinion or a clear opinion on a stock. And if we're looking, you know, at a thousand stocks that come up with some buy or sell ideas, I want 900 of them to be unclear because I want, I want to have a limited number that I have confidence in one way or the other. So most of the time, they're going to be unclear. Okay. So here's kind of just the, uh, the ABCs kind of, of the, the breakout without looking at any of the real price action. So you have a resistance point. You know, this is where we've had a situation where we've had uh, a failed advance or the, the advance fails to move any further. So we have a rally up. We get a pullback, point C. Now, the significance of point C here is that the pullback ends prior to the previous low. So again, what you have is a situation where the buyers are starting to have a greater influence at a higher price. So there's fewer sellers coming into the stock. There's more buyers coming into the stock. There's more anxious buying occurring. Everybody says, well, you know, I'm not going to wait for this low. I'll be a buyer, you know, up here. It's good enough for me. This is what you want to see. As you start to move up to this resistance line again, as it says here, you can begin to anticipate that this is going to take out that high. What you'd want to see in another confirmation that's not in here, because we're just talking about the price, but increasing volume from here to here would be a suggestion that you're getting more vigorous buying, that there's more people coming into the stock, there's more, more money moving into the stock, and there's a good chance that's going to take it out. And then you break out. More than likely, you know, we've got a breakout coming mm -hmm. here. There's going to be a, this, this leg is going to look, at least right in here, it's going to look, look, going to look a heck of a lot different than that one, more than likely. More than likely, we're going to have higher daily volume. We're going to have widening daily ranges. We're going to have closes close to the highs. You know, all of those things that we can spot on the chart, we should, it should look considerably different. If it doesn't, then we're not going to anticipate a breakout. Right. The, the inverse of that would be, you know, low volume rally, lacking energy, tight ranges. It drifts, in a sense, higher. You know, use all these words, and they're kind of subjective terms, but you'll, you know, as you look at this, you'll feel the same thing. You'll say, oh, you know, I remember what John was talking about. You can sense it's not having an energetic move. So you'll hear, you know, unenergetic rally. You hear all these terms, but that's what it is. So the, the real definition of that would be kind of narrow ranges, low volume, just kind of, you know, moving up because there's no real selling, but you're not getting any real major inflow of money. And that will be confirmed typically by your indicators, which will pick up some of that momentum you know, through various measures, whether it's volatility, it's the average daily range, a uh, combination of all that stuff. Okay, intra-bar breakout. Okay, so here's Walt Disney, February 26th to September 11th, same period, same six months here. So what you have here is a situation where we had resistance coming in here at around $18.5. Uh, we moved through this. So you got the bulk of your support right here at this old resistance line at 18 and a half. And then we have this one peak up here, which was that reversal bar. So, you know, here's the debate. What's more important? Is the reversal bar more important? Is this zone more important? So we're going to create it and just call it a zone. So anywhere from here to here is support. It could have picked this particular point here on this pullback to hold. It didn't. It chose to go across here to the bulk of the consolidation. So, if, you know, if you look at that and I said, where's the majority of support? Right? Anybody want to take a stab? The majority, is, uh, I won't make you do it here. It's simple, right? The majority of support is here in this range at 18 
you know, just above $18, 18 and a quarter. This is significant support because we're able to take out that reversal bar. But anywhere in here is the support zone that you're looking for. And then what you have is this move back down to the lower end and it breaks back above here. And that's another good sign that you're probably going to create another advance when you break above this uh, previous support area. You hold here, break above here, and you're off to the races again. Everything's still intact, so to speak. Well, we can say as the base in April and May uh, produced a breakout, uh, if, if that were a valid breakout and we have a new intermediate term uptrend starting, stock just shouldn't come back down into that pattern very far. In this case, it really holds pretty much on top. If, the, if that, where it says intra, intra bar breakout, if, it, if that had pulled back to, let's say, 17 and a half, I would be already suspicious that the breakout was going to abort. And certainly, if it closes in on 17, then, you know, you pull back too far. Uh, so uh, when you're, if you're buying that stock or looking to buy it on, on the pullback in, in June from you know, nearly 21, uh, you know, you could do some buying at, uh, let's say, 19 or thereabouts with a, with a stop somewhere below 18 with, under the theory that it shouldn't pull back that much if this trend is going to remain up. So that's uh, uh, an important concept to know that uh, if a breakout is valid, it just shouldn't go back far into the pattern. Yeah, that's a good point, too, because, again, when we talked about earlier where you can always find a support and resistance point is, you know, this technically is the lower end of this support zone, right, between a little above 18 and $17. But, as we just said earlier, much better to be a seller here, and if it holds 17 to be buying it back, rather than sitting there at 17 hoping it holds, having an opportunity to sell it at 18, you know, I'd much rather be over here at 17 say, okay, you know, it held 17, I'll take a shot. And now i got to stop just under $17, just like I had to stop just under $18. So you don't want to see these congestion areas. And the longer these congestion areas are, if it starts to move through it, the more significant it is. Because these are you know, an area where you're seeing major, major buying come in to, to create this. So buying is overcoming selling. The longer those are, the more significant they are. So a break of those is going to be even more significant from the standpoint of a trend change or some, some other shift in, in the stock movement. Oh, okay. So what we're talking about is a breakout here. He's, dis he's discerning, uh, he's trying to give an example on how we identify breakouts. Uh, a close above the breakout oh, okay. point, yeah. several closes above the breakout point, X percent above the breakout point. And, and, yeah. and in any case, that's what we're trying to do here. All right. See, that, I didn't know what that was. So that's a good point, too, though. How do you define a breakout? So for me... You define yeah. it any way you want. Right. I do, my way, my way to find the breakout is I just use the price action. So move above these resistance points, these levels, is a breakout. So I would consider this the breakout. Um, we can look at it and say, okay, it's got to trade five percent above that. It's got to trade seven percent above that to be a valid breakout. It's been three days above that for it to be a valid breakout. Uh, you can use whatever you want. So for me, it's good enough to see the price action kind of take out those previous highs. I would look again for accompanying volume. I would look for other things to confirm what I'm seeing. Uh, is going to give me supportive evidence for, for why I think that's a breakout. If this was a light volume breakout, I might be inclined to say, well, you know, I want to see it move up a little bit more before I, I trust that. Or maybe I'll wait to see if it pulls back. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. I'll move on to the next one. So again, you're looking for an optimal sign here that this is what you wanted to see in the way of a breakout. So you're looking for confirmation from all the other indicators, from the volume, uh, from other stocks in the group maybe breaking out. There's, there's lots of things you can use for that. It's all about discipline. You know, we see this breakout here. Maybe you missed it, and now you notice the stock at 20 bucks. Uh, do you want to buy it at 20 Well, I, you know, if we're right about this breakout, it probably is a buy at 20 But now we have some indeterminate amount of risk. So patience is important. You know, let's, let's wait for a dip. Maybe it, if it doesn't dip, so be it. But uh, if it does, obviously, we're going to reduce our risk uh, considerably. So. Okay. So here's uh, gaps with and without a retracement. So we talked a little bit earlier in one of these slides where there was a gap to the upside, and, um, and then that was filled to the, coming back to the downside. So 
situation where here's a, a little trend line forming here after this pullback where we have this, this, this low followed by a high. Then we have this pullback, a higher low, moving up to this point here, a higher high. Uh, it creates a little bit of a trend line, and then we have this gap to the downside. Okay, so gaps are significant, right? Because you have a situation where some event has occurred where the, there's such an imbalance between supply and demand that the stock opens either significantly lower or significantly higher because this is the first price that you can actually match buyers and sellers. Okay, so what happens here, Walt Disney, I'm thinking earnings miss typically influences gaps. CEOs sent to the hospital. Uh, somebody fell off a ride in the theme park. I mean, you come up with whatever you want, but there's an, you know, there's an event that occurs. And I'll tell you, it's always uncanny how those bad events occur after this big break in the stock. So, you know, you had plenty of warning that something was going on here before this gap occurred. So there's a reason the stock is not reacting the way it used to. There's a change in perception. And here's probably the piece of news that explains why the stock had already begun to pull back. Then you get this gap to the downside. No retracement back up. It just continues to decelerate to the downside. It keeps moving down, 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 down. Actually, I should say accelerating to the downside. Continuing to collapse here. So whatever this event was, this is the first time we could get buyer and seller together, but it never looked back really from that point, it just kept going lower. And then what we had here to the downside is another gap, right? So it could have been more bad news, downgrade to the stock, everybody's piling on, you know, it's terrible, it's over, it's done. Here's another gap to the downside. Here's that little pivot reversal that we talked about where you say, oh, wait a minute, you know, this has been coming down for a long time. We have this kind of reversal of the upside, and now you start to fill this gap. Okay, so gaps, I don't know, should I, should I bother getting into that? Bill? Well, uh, we, we've <laughs> filling them or not filling them, the importance we've, of it? We've, uh, okay, uh, talked about we've it. talked about that. I mean, we don't, when, the, when the gap occurs, we don't know immediately for sure what kind of a gap it is. So it might take a day or two or three to, to determine it. It's, uh, it's going to, you know, the gap A is, some, is a, either a breakaway or a measuring gap. And gap B here turns out to be an, an exhaustion gap. But we don't know immediately. It takes some trading. Uh, it is significant. Both of those gaps are very significant. The first one was significantly bearish. The second one was a bullish development. You know, all, you know, we knew that a few days later. Yeah, this, this gap creates kind of the clean out at the low. Then you get that reversal. You fill the gap. So now we know that we've, we've kind of taken back this ground. And then we get to move back to the upside. So whatever was going on here... Later turns out to be false, ends up being not as bad as people expected, meaning an overreaction to it, or really just was a situation where you could have had a piece of bad news that flushes out whatever sellers are left. You know, and that's what makes a low. You know, there's no more selling, and you got to move back to the upside. And then, you know, from this to go from here to here, that's maybe all that takes to get it from here to here. It's going to take time. You know, you could drift higher, okay? But to fill gaps, you're typically going to see some volume coming in. You're going to typically see some demand coming in. And to get a bar up like this to the upside, you know, everybody that just sold the stock down here, uh, or maybe sold it up here, saw an opportunity. So if you sold it here, you're probably not a buyer, to be quite honest, because you're just angry and you're moving on, because you can't bear the struggle of having bought it here and sold it here and have this happen to you. So you're disgusted and you don't want to see it anymore. But if you were a seller here and you saw this move down here, you might come in and be a buyer. Now, interestingly enough, I'll go back and just point out here. Notice that where this bar opened, where that gap occurred, and where that price opened that day, was basically at the support area. So this became new resistance. So not only do you have these price bars here, you got the gap as well. So this is going to be significant, significant overhead supply. You know, there's a lot of people still in this thing looking to get out somewhere in that gap. Mm -hmm. and, we never, and we never want to take the position that, well, if we don't know uh, where the low is, the information is not important. It's very important. I think you see that... The, after the down, after gap B, it fusses around for a while. Then there's a great big up day, 28.30. And you might say, God damn it, I sold it at 26 and I made a big mistake. No, we didn't make a mistake. We have an op we're going to get an opportunity to buy that stock again. You take your loss, you come back, and in this case, the stock has a setback, you know, tests that support line again, and then, and then resumes the uptrend. So we're, we're never trying to be... Buying the low or selling the high. What we're trying to do is determine the trend when it's clear and the profit to risk profile is good, then we take the action. 
<clears throat> so we're talking a little bit too, gets a little bit of psychology of trading or investing, right? So these are all great tools, and they're going to make you money if you use these tools. I can't guarantee it, but I can tell you I can guarantee it, right? I can't say that. But I would guarantee you, you know, you're going to have more winning trades than losing trades. But what, what Phil just talked about, I think, is very, very important, is that if you can understand that you just need to sell this, and that you have an opportunity to buy it back, and you do not let the fact that you lost money in it previously have any bearing on whether or not this stock is going to go up from here, because it really doesn't. Just realize that. You know, if we were right, if we were wrong, doesn't mean this one's going to be right or be going to be wrong. We tend to think that way because we're human beings and that's the way we learn. You know, this was bad. Don't touch the fire again. Don't go back to that stock because I'll get burned. It's really not. So having the ability to use these things objective and be objective is really the key to successful or long-term success and long-term profitability from trading. And it's a lot easier said than done. So it's, yeah, it's like, easy. yeah, you know, you just sell it down here and you buy it back. It's, that's right. It's that easy, but when you have to do it, it's really not. Well, you have to learn that, that discipline because it really is that easy. And if you can keep it that easy, you're going to make a lot of money. Uh, that I can, I can promise you. So I, the best traders I know have that ability to just step aside and say, I was wrong. You know, doesn't mean they were wrong. I mean, it just, it just didn't, wasn't the right time to be in that stock, long or short. And if the opportunity arises again or a new opportunity arises, they go right back into it, no problem. It's the P&L that's important, not whether I made money or, uh, in, on that particular trade on Disney or not. You know, it's the end of the week or the end of the month. If I'm net ahead, it doesn't matter if I had 10 losing trades and one winning trade. If I'm ahead, I mean, that's the name of the game, over time making money, not being right or, or wrong on one particular stock every day. Uh, it's all about probabilities. It's all about containing risk. And let, you know. Is anybody a retail broker? Are there any retail brokers left in the world? No? All right. Not, not so I spent a little time as a retail broker. We don't let them in my class. Oh, we don't let them in your class. I, I spent a little time as a retail broker. So tell your client that you just had him sell the stock at $34 and you want to buy it back the next day at $35. And he'll give you all the psychological reasons for why what I just said is true. And he, he can't do it. He, he'll tell you you're out of your mind. Let me let you do it. Okay, but the reason you want to buy it back at $35 is because when it goes back to $35, that's when you want to be an owner of the stock. If you had him sell it the day before at $34 or a week before at $34, won't want to hear it. So I'm not saying that you know the retail audience is dumb or unsophisticated, but it's just it's not how it works. Okay, a little example. That's all. All right, breakout filter. So we're getting back to this idea here that if we get a breakout above some recent highs, above a trading range, and we begin to move out, when is it a true breakout? So this one's putting a three percent filter, saying okay, it's not a breakout until it trades above. 3%, excuse me, above the, the breakout level. So pick that point, you know, a little above uh, 18 and a half in here. We're going to add 3%. So I'm not going to be a buyer until about 1920 on the stock. That's when I have a real breakout. That's when I can enter the trade. So, you know, again, how many trades do you want to be in? How active do you want to be? How many false breakouts are you willing to take on? It's a point of uh, personal preference. Some people will put the filters. There's plenty of filters that you're going to put on a trade. It's going to keep you out of a good trade. That's the only thing I'll say. There's plenty of filters that are going to keep you out of a false breakout. It's a trade-off. You know, there's always opportunities, even in the worst environments. This is just a filter on what you're willing to you know, say, well, that's what I want to see. So I won't poo-poo the filter guys, but you know, they're kind of you know, maybe a little uh, wishy-washy. So they're always looking for a reason not to be a buyer. But I think sometimes the filters can work against you from the standpoint of, you know, I'm going to wait for that little extra move, and then you say, well, it's 4% above it, so now it's a little bit too much. I don't want to be a buyer. So just be careful with the filters from that standpoint. They can, you know, influence you the wrong way as well. Some what? people like to use them just as, again, it cleans out some of the noise. It'll reduce the amount of whipsaws that you get. Um, just a matter of preference. So it's a trade-off between the amount of risk you're taking on the particular trade versus the whipsaw. Do you want a lot of whipsaws or a small number of whipsaws? It's really a head thing. You know, you can be successful either way. You just have to know your own head. See, and, of course, a 3% filter. We ain't a day trader if we're using a 3% filter. Right. And then, you know, the other thing that you're actually doing, you know, you risk-reward. Well, if I'm a buyer here uh, at 18 and a half, and I know that I'm wrong under 18, or that's my stop, you know, I just increase my risk parameter because I really still can't sell this stock until it breaks $18. So that's the trade-off. Again, as you, I always prefer to get in there at the optimal entry point, I like to call it. So, you know, as a technician, again, we're identifying what we perceive 
as a point or an inflection point where something should occur. And if it does occur, my opinion is you want to take advantage of it as soon as you can. So again, I'll be whipsawed a little bit. You know, there'll be plenty of trades that do this and then pull back and I'll have to sell them. It doesn't bother me. You know, I'm, I'm great at selling losing positions. I'm terrible at selling winning positions. But I can't tell you anybody that's good at selling winning positions. So don't worry about that part. If you keep control of the losses, keep them, you know, 5 8%, whatever the number is, you know, you're just going to keep yourself in the game and eventually you're going to make money. All right. Breakouts to support levels. All right. So let's see here. All right. So here's previous. Um, we had a breakout here uh, above this previous highs here in this 19 and a half range. We get a pullback to that support level. We get another move up here. Here's a new support level. So we keep getting these breakouts and these pullbacks to these different support levels. And these support levels are what they are. This is where you're finding buying. This is where you want to be entering these trades. Um, and then we've talked about this already at length, but previous support, it says here, equals a price objective on the breakout. So this is where you can look for these things to move to the upside or move to the downside from the standpoint of when they break these areas where we're going to look for the next price target to be. I don't know if I explained this one quite right, Bill. You want to? Well, uh, the, the basic gist of this chart is here, we're trying to make the point that, uh, well, two points. One, <clears throat> uh, in an uptrend, surpassed resistance levels become support. And then when the trend is down, broken support levels become resistance. And th those are the observations on that chart. And, of course, that, that gives you some guide as to targets. You know, we're, looking, uh, we're looking back at previous congestion areas to, to try to identify. There's a lot of ways of coming up with support and resistance. You know, we can use uh, channels or, 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 or distance from least squares or whatever. I, I prefer to go back and look at history and say, where was the last congestion area? So when the stock is declining here, you know, I see a congestion area here. So this is a, would be a logical spot to expect some support. It does for a while breaks it eventually, fail back at a resistance area, this low, you know, another little congestion area. It's never going to be perfect, but you need some kind of a guide. When you're in a trend, uh, the trend is in force, uh, where is it going to find support or where is it going to find resistance in an uptrend? Well, often the previous history is going to give us, give us some insights. And there's a lot, there are, all, there are other rules as well. Uh, round numbers are psychological points, especially big round numbers like 100 or 10 or going from one digit to two digits to three digits. Uh, people remember those numbers. So they're, normally they're, they're more important simply because people think they're more important, they become more important. So lots of, lots of ways of identifying it. <clears throat> Fibonacci sequence, anybody familiar with that? Okay, so, I mean, I've, I've seen guys trade off of Fibonacci numbers and correlate, corollaries. So, you know, 34, and then the guy, you know, you get to 44, and it's a corollary, and then you get 55, and there's sellers at 55 if they were a buyer at 34 because it's the next Fib number. It, that's perfectly fine by me. I mean, I, I don't have a problem taking 20 points out of a trade, you know, but it's just a, w a way to sell them. But sometimes you'll actually see stocks trade towards those Fibonacci numbers or pull back to them as well. All right. Stop for stop. Uh, here, oh. <laughs> um, you might not even be familiar with this term. Let me. Do, uh, yeah, what what happened to these guys? Have you heard that? Well, go ahead. You can explain false, it. I'll false, false breakout. breakout right. or, okay. So it's I mean, an I old, think, old term. I right. Know. Well, the specialist breakout refers to the specialists on the floor. They're not quite as what they used to be, but they used to control everything uh, until they, they kind of messed up their gig. But, um, you know, that's what they would do. So specialists look at the charts, too. And they know that when they can get a stock to trade above a certain point, they're going to attract buyers. So what they can do is they can actually create the stock to break out. And they trap all of us technicians in there. We all go in to be a buyer, but there's really no real buying behind that after it. So they'll trap you. They'll be selling you the stock, you know, as you buy it. So they have a short position. Boom. You know, you pull the buying out from underneath it and it rolls over. So you get these false breakouts. So that's basically what uh, I think this is referring to. But, you know, again, a false breakout is a false breakout. It occurs for a lot of reasons. Uh, it, it can occur because there's just not 
flying behind something. It can happen on an open. Um, you know, that's the other thing that happens a lot of times is you see stocks kind of gap above resistance points on the open or kind of move right above it at the opening of the, of the session. There's not a lot of volume behind it yet. That might be another type of filter that you use besides a price filter is, you know, what do we really got going on here? When did the breakout occur? Was it orderly? Always like to kind of, I actually prefer to see a little slightly down open and then you get the buyers come in boom, and then blow it through there rather than just seeing these gaps to the upside or running stops, so to speak. The other thing the specialist has on his books are all those buy stop orders, buy technicians and whatnot. So it used to be a little pure from that standpoint than it is now. And they have so many different trading vehicles, so many different platforms, a lot more clarity, you know, a lot more transparency with what goes on with trading. So they've kind of lost the edge. But... I think that's the point of this here is just that you get these false breakouts or breakdowns. So here's the situation, right, where this looks like it's collapsing. You know, you get down to this point here where you get under 21, you're into this little support zone, and boom, it turns right around. So this is looking like a great short up here, just above 2150. You know, you think this is going all the way back down to 20 or 19 and a half. Everything's cooking along real nice, and then boom, you get this big reversal gap to the upside, and it blows out like that. You know, that, that's a tough situation. Again, all the more reason to have excellent risk control is... If you did short it over here, unfortunately, you know, you're not making much money. If you short it on this break here, well, you know, worst case, I'll walk out of the trade, break even, move on, no big deal. So. It doesn't matter what you paid for the long position. It matters what you, what you sell it for, right? It's always about controlling risk, whether you're long or short. If there's going to be a lot of whipsaws, so be it. Uh, there's no magic formula. Small losses, big profits. The other thing that you can see here, and this comes in as small profits, big loss thing, is that if you look, and you're a buyer here, okay, on this pullback, uh, using the previous congestion areas, gaps, other pivot points on the chart, you can kind of get an idea of what your risk will be. So you can predetermine it. Okay, so let's say you don't want to take any trade that's going to have greater than a 10% downside risk for a long trade. So, you know, if I'm a buyer here at 2160, and I say, well, you know, next support's going to come in down here in this, this 21 zone, uh, 60 cents, is that within my risk parameters? And that gives you a reason to take the trade or not take the trade. So you can kind of predetermine your risk. It's another great tool to do that. You know, it's not an absolute, but it, it sets up risk versus reward. You say, okay, if I'm a buyer here, when am I getting to the upside? Well, I know I got major resistance up at 23. So am I going to, am I going to risk 60 cents to make a buck 50? Maybe, why not? Two to one, that's pretty good odds. So I'll take that trade. Okay. Moving averages. We talk about moving, guys do moving averages? No, this no. is it. This yeah. is it. Oh, this is it. Moving average. Okay, so moving average is, is basically just taking, in this particular case, the closing price over a period of time, in this case 60 days, adding up 60 days of price action uh, on the close, divided by 60, you get a point, and it moves, right? Each day, one point, one day drops off, the next day comes on, and it creates this line, which is also another indication of trend. So what it does is it kind of smooths out this noise here in the price action. It tells you, okay, over a 60-day period, what's basically happening with the price action? If the line is moving down, you have a downtrend. If the line is sideways, we have lateral consolidation, no trend. And then you have a line moving higher, you have an uptrend. So the moving averages are great tools for kind of taking out the noise, confirming what you're seeing in the other trend lines, and giving you another objective point is to say, is there really a trend here? So even though this was the beginning of the trend, you can see where it starts, where the line went from down to flat, and it starts to hook up here. So if we were using the moving average as an indication of trend and we wanted to be a buyer, you know, we probably aren't a buyer till over here where this trend starts to move up from this standpoint. The trend line, excuse me, the moving average is also another point of support and resistance. And you will see these price bars move back towards the moving average. Why do they stop there? Because that's also where you're finding the trend. Okay, so that's where you're finding support. The reason it stops there is there's buyers coming in. Same thing's happening with the trend line. And there's plenty of systems out there that buy pullbacks to different moving averages. Um, as, again, just trying to buy support and sell resistance. Some people are more visually oriented. Some people are more, or more quantitatively oriented. I mean, if you, got, you can trade with a moving average without looking at a chart. You know, the computer tells you whether the moving average is going up, down, or sideways. Uh, you can also create trading rules around moving averages. I can look at this chart and say, I'm not going to buy that stock unless the stock is above the 60-day moving average and the 60-day moving average is rising. I've just created a trading rule. 
therefore, when it no longer fits those parameters, I've got to get out of the trade. Stock breaks the moving average, the moving average turns down, we have a new situation. Uh, The, 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 we can use, well, we'll even get into uh, two moving averages. Okay, so here we have a, a shorter term 20 day moving average and a 60 day moving average. Again, what's your time frame? Uh, which one are you looking to trade off of? But we can use them in combination and we look for these crossovers. Okay, so you have a situation where on a 20 day time frame you have an uptrend, you're crossing above what is now, we'll call it a flat to rising 60 day moving average. So these are called a um, or the golden cross or a bullish cross used to be the term that you would use for these things. Uh, and it's just a suggestion, again, that something is improving within the price configuration. So for that to occur, for the 20 day to go from under the, the 60, in this case, to above it, you're seeing improving price action. So this is telling you short-term trend is improving, intermediate-term trend is beginning to improve, but this will tell you to look for this one to begin to improve as well. So, you know, if you want to use the 20 day moving averages as your stop, as, as your trend line, you're going to have a lot more whipsaws, you're going to have more ins and outs, um, but you're also going to have much tighter risk control. You can't lose as much if you're going to use this one as your support uh, area or as your indication of trend. Uh, and then you have a similar situation where you get the, uh, the negative cross or bear cross to the downside where, again, look at this in the context of what's happening. Since April to the late part of August or the middle part of August, the 20-day is trading above the 60-day moving average, right? So that's, that's healthy, it's in advance, everything's moving along. When this starts to cross back to the downside, something has changed again. Simple as that, okay? And that's negative. You know, can this happen and then cross back up and cross back down? You know, those are the, those are the pitfalls and the dangers of using the moving averages um, as an absolute. But what I like to use these for is if you can get these crosses or these moving averages to coincide with the price point, that's a really good signal. And I would just warn you with the moving averages is that some people will use them as absolutes, but a lot of times you'll find a moving average that's trading somewhat further away from a true pocket of resistance or support on the price action. And they'll say, okay, you know, I'm going to sell that as it breaks above the declining 50-day moving average. It'll break above the 50-day, it'll go to the resistance price point, and then move back down. So, you know, mess around with them, find out what you're comfortable with. But, you know, different environments will produce situations where you may have to be a little bit more interpretive rather than absolute with these. By definition, moving averages are going to lag. So it is a trend-following rule. Uh, and that's fine. You can, you can create a rule that says, I want to be long this stock when the 20-day is rising and it's above a rising 60-day. I want to be out of the stock when those conditions no longer prevail. Such a rule will capture a big move up and a big move down and whipsaw you when there's no trend, when there's no trend. So uh, that's what you have to put in your head. I don't mind getting whipsawed uh, but I, because I know when I do have a powerful trend, I'm going to be on the right side based on, on that rule. Okay. Oh, well, here we go. Perfect example of the whipsaws, right? So you get into a period of lateral price action, consolidation, no real trend, and you get these moving averages to whip back and forth in their direction, and you get the shorter term one or the quicker one to whip back and forth across the slower one. So here's a situation where, you know, honestly, it's, it's, it's a big mess, right? There isn't much going on in here. So if you're using your, your crosses as signals, you're just getting whipped in and out, in and out, like that. So this is kind of the pitfall, the danger, or what can happen if, you, if you're using just one, we'll call it system, or one tool in isolation. And that's why I said in the beginning, you know, look at everything combined. Look at, look at different tools. So in a situation like this, moving averages, they're not that helpful. The trend is not that helpful because there, there is no trend. It, you know, it's a consolidation. So, you know, you want to be a seller at the upper end, you want to be a buyer at the lower end, and everything in between is just a lot of noise. So depending on your time frame, you know, maybe you can capture this three or four day decline or, or this three or four day rally. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's kind of the danger that you have there. And then eventually, you know, you get this cross to the downside and, you know, if these lows are broken, then, you know, that was the real signal. Okay, so here's the trend line versus that simple moving average. 
Um, you can use an exponential moving average to create, you know, more weight to the current price to action and things like that. It depends on what you want to use. I, I just use the simples. It's pretty easy. Sometimes we use the exponentials. It just depends on if you think the current price data is more important than the old price data. You know, I, I, I can buy into that theory as well. Um, but what you have here is a situation where the trend line is basically following the moving average. Uh, they're almost the same point, and you get a pullback to the trend line and the moving average simultaneously, and you get a break of the trend line and the moving average. And you can see the trend line's moving up. Notice how this trend line, excuse me, is now acting as resistance, just like we talked about the price point. So this price point here, this resistance zone up around, we'll call it 20 and 3 quarters, 21, is also where the trend line comes in, and that break of the trend line means that is now resistance. So that recovery to the previous trend line is a good spot to be a seller for initiating a short position. Notice the moving average is flattened out as well, so it's confirming this trend break. You're getting a confluence of signals here, suggesting, again, something's changed, something's happening, it's gotten worse, look out, you know, and then you get this break to the downside. And this is also a good point, what Phil just said, is that these lag, because it's taking this price data as well with this. So notice that the price action's already started down, well ahead of the moving average turning down. And typically what you'll get is this will hook down and then you'll have a reaction back up towards it. That'll give you another entry point if you missed out on a short sale or if you're looking to sell it. That might be a good spot to kind of use some short-term strength to pull, your, pull out of those positions. Uh, how do you determine the length of the moving average, of course, is, is that's something that you have to do by experience. In general, though, the more volatile the stock, the shorter the moving average. The shorter the time horizon you want to trade the shorter the moving average. So if we if we have an investment type position in a non volatile stock, you can use a much longer term moving average, and that you just have to experiment with that. Now this is. So this All right. So here we're doing ratio of current price to the moving average. So what you're looking at is how far above or below you are. The moving average. So I would say it's similar to what we talked about when you get the accelerated moves against the trend line. It's the same situation here. As you start to move above the moving average, and I've heard this concept used, and again, it, it becomes interpretive in different market environments. I think you have to use slightly different rules, but you'll hear somebody say, you know, it's trading 100% above its 50-day moving average, or it's 100% above its 200-day moving average. It's just an objective indication of how extended the move is. So when that typically happens, not that it can't get more, but you typically are running out of time. They don't move much beyond that type of a move. So, you know, you can do a little bit of a historical study and say, you know, how far does the average stock get above its moving average before it begins to pull back? You know, that's what you're looking for in, in this situation. So as these things get accelerated, as the price gets accelerated above the moving average, you know that the move's getting extended and becoming vulnerable to that kind of pullback where it has to re revert back to the mean. Uh, is, is the way I would think about it. So the trend line is the good spot, excuse me, not the trend line, the moving average is the good spot to look for that to pull back to. And that's where we want to see it hold. This one broke the, trend, the uh, moving average. You know, we had the move down here. You can see the reaction during the decline back to these moving averages as well. You know, here's a little whipsoid period where it went from down to up and then we had it roll back over here. And you can see that these things as they get too extended, as the price action gets too extended below the moving average, you'll have a reversion up. Again, it's, prob it, it, it's going to be people covering shorts. It's going to be whatever the reason is. But that is a good objective measure of how far something is moving. And it gives you like an, a benchmark or a way of knowing, okay, where are we going to see some buying come in if it's a decline? Where are we going to see some selling come in if it's an advance? How much more can we sustain? And again, depending on the environment, end of a bull market, end of a bear market, beginning of a bull market or bear market, you'll see you know, stocks get more extended. You'll have to give them a little bit more room. And other times you won't. It's a matter of discipline, you know, using uh, this technique along with, uh, you know, identifying the uh, the, pet, the pattern, or, uh, the trend. Uh, it'll tell us that we don't want to reach for the stock. Let's anticipate a consolidation. You know, they, they will revert to the mean, um, and if they don't for a long period of time, fine. That means you're missing that stock. So be it. But it, it, it's a matter of discipline. In, in, in not chasing uh, the long side uh, or the short side. OK. 
say directional movement. So this is ADX? ADX. Yeah. Okay. So the situation here is we talked a little bit earlier too about indicators. So what we're doing is we're overlaying an indicator which evaluates the strength of a trend. That's what it's designed to do. Um, so it, it's a, two components. This average directional movement is the solid line. It's created by a plus DMI and a minus DMI. I actually like this indicator a lot. Do you like this one? Do you use this? I don't use it. You don't use it? Okay. Um, so this is one of my personal favorites. We'll leave Phil out of it for now. Though. How's that? Um, I don't want him to poo-poo it on me. But. So what this tells you, again, is the strength of a trend. So when this average directional line is rising, okay, the, tr the trend is strengthening. The plus DMI minus DMI tells you the direction. If you have plus DMI above the yellow line, the red line, the minus DMI, that means the trend's improving to the upside, or an uptrend is, is strengthening. Vice versa, if the trend crosses above, then you have a downtrend. So all you're looking for is this directional line to be rising to tell you that you have strength in the trend, the amount of strength in the trend, how much of a trend is there, and is it continuing to strengthen or is it beginning to weaken? So it's actually a pretty good tool, I find, in helping you confirm what you're seeing in the price action. And it's, it's coincidental, sometimes leads you ahead of the price action, where, again, based on the way this is calculated, you know, some narrowing of the ranges, some extended moves, and then a lack of that afterwards, these things will hook down very quickly. And you'll begin to see that the trend is weakening here. At this point, price action's broken. Now you're starting to see this break a little bit more here. This breaks here. See, on this recovery, there's really no recovery in the directional movement. That's how you know that's just kind of like a little throwback. So it's a divergence. Can we talk about divergences? That's okay? Absolutely. Okay, so situation like this is where here's the previous pivot point in the trend or the strength of the trend up here. This is moving lower and lower and lower while the price action is actually rallying. So that's telling you that this is kind of not confirming. This is a divergence suggesting that this is going to fail relatively soon, that this is not the beginning of a new move, uh, and then you'll get these subsequent declines like this. Notice that during this consolidation, the ADX is continuing to erode, so the trend is eroding even more. And then what you get is you finally get a break in the price action. Uh, this is a simple moving average 14 day up here that they're using. What happens now is that during all of this move down, this minus DMI has crossed above. It's now in control. So you're getting a more directional movement to the downside. And then right here on this break, starts to coincide with that trend turning back up, indicating that you're beginning to get a new trend and that this trend is to the downside. Sometimes this will happen before the price action, sometimes right with it, sometimes after it. But it's just another way to confirm what you're seeing in here. Just remember, all, all of these momentum indicators are derivatives of price. And uh, if you're quantitatively oriented rather than, uh, rather than oriented by the chart, uh, you, might, you might take comfort in, in working with uh, one of those indicators. But it's a derivative of price, and uh, there's nothing there that you, you, you can't get simply by looking at the price action. But this summarizes it for you. It's sort of a, a tool or a crutch, if you will. Uh, I'll give you one trading system. You want, want a quick trading system? We have time? Go ahead. Okay, so here, using the average directional movement. What you want is you want an ADX over 30. That's indicative of a very strong trend. So what you want is ADX over 30. We'll talk about an uptrend first. When you have an ADX over 30, use a 20-day moving average. So we'll look at a daily chart. 20-day uh, moving average, when the stock pulls back to the 20-day moving average and the ADX is above 30, buy it. Stop yourself out 5% below the low of that bar. Uh, it works very well. You know, for, I'd call it a few days to a couple of weeks. From the standpoint of catching what will normally be just a short-term reaction down, you should have a move back up to the previous high. So again, depending on how much the pullback was, you can get an indication of whether you're going to make 5% on the upside, or it's 20% possibility, but you can set up a situation where you have a very, very tight stop, and you can buy something right on a moving average that has a strong trend. So you're buying that pullback, that counter trend move, in really what's a very strong trend. You can just invert it for a short sale. Okay, so you can set up screens in any, any programs that you have, whether it's Metastock or TC2000 or anything you have. Find all the stocks that have an ADX over 30, and then look for the 20-day moving average, or vice, you know, filter it any way you want. Anyway, I like it. And in the environment we're currently in, gives you something to do when there's, there's not much else to find right now. So it, it keeps you a little bit honest, too. Okay. There's no charge for that, by the way. 
Is that what it's worth? Well, if I, I can tell them the ones I, I'm doing, <laughs> and then you can go out and buy them and help me make money, but that's okay. But, all right. Um, so here what you're doing is you're putting a, an envelope around a moving average. All right, why don't you take The moving one? average is not on, on the here. chart. Right, okay. right. So it's, a, it's, it's called an envelope. Uh, you're, you've, uh, you've probably heard of Bollinger Bands. This is a trading envelope. All we do is we take a moving average, in this case a 60-day, which is you don't see on the chart, and, and create a bands, in this case 7% above and 7% below, to give us an idea where most of the trading is going to be. doesn't mean you can't go above or below the, uh, the upper and lower ends of the band, but uh, you know, do you want to do you want to sell something when it's at the lower end of the band? No, you probably want to sell when it's near the higher end of the band, right? So it's another way of gaining some discipline. Uh, looking to sell when it's uh, ex extended on the upside, looking to buy when it's extended on the downside. You obviously have to use it in conjunction with other kinds of indicators, but uh, it, it sort of keeps you honest, keeps you from paying too much or selling uh, too low. And uh, this is the Bollinger same thing band. with, use, use the Bollinger Bands? Right, so these are just two standard deviations above the price action. So you do another regression analysis, the Bollinger Bands are two standard deviations. So again, you can see everything kind of trades within the confines of these bands, so to speak. So this is meant to keep you on the right side of the trade, or the right side of the trend, I should say. Not trade, but the trend. So you can handle a little bit of volatility and understand where you are. And typically, you don't really see moves beyond two standard deviations. We did in the fourth quarter of last year, you saw stocks going four or five standard deviations because of the volatility. But normally they stay within here. Uh, and this just sets you up with parameters and you trade between here. So similar to the envelope concept. Right. The envelope is a fixed percent above and below the moving average. The Bollinger Band is a standard deviation or two above and below the moving average. Back to, back to the beginning, huh? Back to the beginning. Yeah. Uh, that's the very first chart. Okay. All right, we're through them all. Did you have, you had some other things? You wanted to uh, just real quick, I'll take two more minutes of your time. I, I did those two handouts real quick because I just wanted to show you how it's actually been working um, over here. So if you look at the first one, let's just look at the shorter one. It says S&P 500, 2002 to present. The one that doesn't have the words cut off, I apologize. Um, you know, there's a trend channel from two, the 2002, 2003 lows. So you can see that little sideways consolidation at the bottom. You, know, you want to go back to your pattern recognition, maybe argue a little head and shoulder bottom back in 2002, 2003. You have a neckline that came in, you know, up around 950 on the S&P. You broke above it, and we started to make that nice little orderly trend channel. So that's, that's a two standard deviation trend channel. Moved all the way up from 2003 to the peak uh, in the end of 2007 within that trend channel. Then you can see that we broke in early 2008. Here's your recovery. You know, now you have a new downtrend channel coming to the downside. Uh, and then this is acceleration to the downside, which was very severe, and that was the fall. So that was late September into early October. So you had relatively orderly decline going. Uh, Phil used the word, you know, normal bear market. You know, we're just kind of pulling back. You had a nice rally for three or four years. You know, economy slow and you're due for the next slowdown. So you nice orderly pullback. And then the banking system went to hell and the real fear came into the market and you got that acceleration to the downside. Uh, where you're sitting right now is you kind of have an attempt to build something down here, but it's really just a little bit of a consolidation within that downtrend, which is a little bit concerning because there's been a lot of good news. There's a lot of talk of stimulus. There's a lot of talk of fixing the problems and you're not going anywhere. So I'm a little concerned that we keep hanging out around 810, 815 on the S&P, and we bump up a little bit, but then we get right back down there. So just realize, you know, the longer you kind of hang around a support area without putting any upside in there, the greater the risk becomes that the support area is going to break. So those November lows may be in jeopardy over the next few weeks. Do you agree or disagree? Well, I think until proven otherwise, we haven't made a low. I haven't made a low. Okay. All right. Now, the other chart, what I wanted to show, this is really interesting. It's going to tie a little bit more in. That's the S&P 500. It's actually a monthly chart. It says weekly, but it's a monthly chart just so we didn't have too many price bars. 1980 to the present. So if we go back to 1980 and see that's really where the bull cycle began, you can see that you had a very orderly advance from 1981 or 82 it started 
okay, till about the mid-1990s. You see the acceleration into the latter 90s to the upside, all culminating in the tech bubble in the late 90s, where, you know, it was easy to make 10, 20 percent, 30 percent of stock every day. It was a situation where we talked earlier about it was too many stocks to buy. Everything was breaking out. Everything was going up. It was easy. Everybody was a genius. Okay? Then you had, you had the peak, and then you had another pullback. And that was really the first, I guess you'd call it, bear correction since the, the rally began in 82. Our first real corrective decline. So remember that, you know, in 1987, there was a, there was a break. So all of that stayed within that trend channel. And it wasn't until the peak in 2000 that you had your first real bear market correction. And then we had that low that we talked about, and we had a rally back. And the significance of this, is I just wanted to point out, is that looks like a big double top. Very uncanny that we got right back to the 2000 highs on the last rally. This was driven by tech. This was driven by basic materials and commodities. You know, the China bubble and all those other things. You and know the count out of the double top? What's that? The count out of the double top. Well, do, we want to even, do we want to it's tell them that? Zero. Zero. <laughs> You're going all the way back, right? I don't know. We better hope President Obama has uh, some good ideas. But uh, what you are on now is you're, you're sitting on the 2003 lows. So it's basically just kind of this huge range. So can we say that it is a secular bear market? You can't say that yet, but it doesn't look like it's a bull market anymore. So we're kind of in a major transition. The reason I wanted to point it out is because we're really talking about 30 years, or just shy of 30 years of price action. So we are at a significant inflection point right now, and it makes sense. So you hear the word recession, depression, why it's not a depression. We're spending $2 trillion, $3 trillion. There's not enough money to run all these programs. I won't get into the economics of it all. But significant price action here, and it is kind of historic when you look at it. I, I think when we look back, it'll be a historic time from the standpoint of what's going on in the price action here. So I just wanted to point it out. You, know, you can see the trend channels. That's how they work. Um, the accelerations, the previous lows, it's in real time. You know, this is a very, very long-term macro look. Um, it's been very hard to make money over any time frame that really extends beyond a few days uh, over the past few months. Uh, it's been very hard. I will tell you this. I think, uh, and we'll have the say for posterity because we're taping this, so we'll go back and you can say 30 years from now, John was right. Uh, I think, you know, it, I'm glad you guys are taking the class. I think technical analysis is extremely important discipline, whether you're fundamentally oriented or you're going to trade off of technicals or you're going to be a systematic trader. And I will tell you that if you are not using technicals right now, you have, in my opinion, no shot at making money right now. There is no fundamental value. Uh, the idea of, you know, the way I'm going to buy a stock and my risk parameters, if it's down 20%, I'm going to go buy another 5% of that position or 2% and the fundamental valuations. It doesn't, it's just not working. It's not working. So the beauty of technical analysis, and I think, you know, Phil talked about this a lot, and I'll just sum it up with this one point and I'll stop, uh, is it is a great and excellent risk control mechanism. You know where you're going to get in and out of every stock. You know what your price target can be, and it lets you measure that, and that's the beauty of it. So we're out there raising money right now. We had a good year last year, and people say, well, what did you learn about last year about risk control? So I can look at them and I can say, look, I learned about risk control 15 years ago, and I've been using it, and that's why we were up last year, okay? Because we understand that just because we think a stock is going up doesn't make it go up, and just because it goes down isn't a reason to buy it or buy more of it. And that's the problem, I think, with fundamental analysis is at what point do you sell something? At what point is the valuation no longer the, the right valuation? If you love it at 18 and it goes to 16, you got to love it more because it's cheaper. you got to love it more at 12. And that's the problem. This is the way people have been buying stocks, you know, probably for the last six years, seven years, maybe longer, if you want to go out, but it's be more in vogue. And since nobody went to Harvard, right, we can pick on the Harvard. The Harvard MBA types, they got their head handed to them last year. A lot of, a lot of funds down 38, 40%. Four years worth of movement in the stock market, gone. You know, and if you really, if you go back to, you know, if we look at that chart and you go back to where you are, you know, you're back to levels you were in 1996. It's 12 years of really no progress if you, if you weren't using good risk control to pull yourself out of the tech stocks in 2000, to know that the next thing to move was going to be basic materials and housing, and see those trend changes occurring, and then get out of that stuff when it began to peak first quarter 
first half of last year for the basic materials, the housing stocks a couple of years ago. So, so I just think it's an excellent risk control mechanism. It's a great discipline. Uh, you should incorporate it in no matter what your discipline is, and, and I think it'll be very, very, very helpful. And I think technicians are going to rule for the next few years as we get through all these problems, and we'll be back in vogue instead of uh, considered Ouija board and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, everybody thinks they can read a chart. Maybe they can, but there's a little bit more to it than just looking at the, the price chart every day. So and that's it. I appreciate you guys' time.